talked about in our first unit of the semester, atoms, properties of atoms. What's their structure? What are they like? Second test coming up next week. What's that going to be on? How atoms bond together to make molecules or ionic matter or metals. It's bonding. What's our third test going to be on? Why are different substances solids, liquids, or gases? And this particular next unit is going to start off by talking about the phases of solids and liquids. And we can describe the phase of a matter or what state it's in, solid, liquid, or gas, by a theory called the kinetic molecular theory. It makes the assumption that matter is composed of tiny particles, which is a really wonderful assumption because matter is composed of tiny particles. It's either made up of ions or atoms or molecules, but it assumes that these tiny particles are in constant motion. Thus the word kinetic in kinetic molecular theory. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Kinetic means things are moving. So if we try to picture a solid, a liquid, and a gas as tiny particles that are moving, then we can actually visualize why something might be a solid, liquid, or gas. Here would be examples of what a solid and liquid and a gas would look like according to the kinetic molecular theory. They're all made up of tiny particles and you can see they're all moving. But if you have the tiny particles that are attracted together so strongly that they cannot move from where they're located, see this? That's when you have a solid. So what can you say about the uh, shape of a solid? If the particles are attracting so strongly that they get stuck together and they can't move, they would have a definite shape. What can you say about the volume of the solid? In a solid, the particles are all essentially touching each other. You can't compress them any closer together. So if matter exists in a solid state, it has a definite volume also. How are those particles moving? It looks like they're stuck in a point and they're just vibrating around a point. So we say that in a solid state, the individual particles have a vibration motion. So we can define the solid state of matter as any type of matter that has a definite shape. So it holds its cube shape or its spherical shape or its crystal shape, whatever it is, has a definite volume, it can't be compressed, and it has particles that are moving, but they only have a vibration motion. Now, what's a liquid? In a liquid, the particles are still close to each other. They're still touching each other, but now they're actually moving around independently. They're not locked in a position. So because they're moving around, they're almost like a bunch of marbles in a bucket. If you shake the bucket, the marbles are going to roll over each other. So what does that mean? If you pour them from one container to another, they're gonna occupy the shape of the new container. So if you have uh, a substance that's a liquid, it has an indefinite shape, but because the molecules are essentially as close together as they can be, you can't compress them. They still have a definite volume. So that's like a solid. What kind of motion are they undergoing? They're undergoing a rolling motion as they roll over each other. So we define a liquid as any type of matter that has an indefinite shape that'll take the shape of its container it does have a definite volume because the molecules are touching each other, they're as close as they can be. And the particles have a more vigorous type of motion. Instead of a vibrating motion, they have a rolling motion. This chapter will be talking about solids and liquids because they're similar in that the particles are touching each other, they're as close as they can be, so they have definite volumes. A gas is very different. In, in a gas, the individual particles are not attracted to each other very strongly, so they fly apart and they exist as individual particles. If they do that, that means they can fill up the shape of any container they're in. So they have an indefinite shape and they'll fill up the volume of the container they're in. They'll have an indefinite volume. So liquids or uh, gases are very different. We'll actually come back later in the semester and spend the whole chapter talking just about gases. The type of motion those particles are undergoing is they're undergoing straight line motion until they hit the wall or hit one another. And so for a gas, we define that as a type of matter with an indefinite shape an indefinite volume, and the particles have straight line motion to them. So we're going to do some introductory concepts concerning liquids and solids today. And we're going to talk about some properties that anything that's in the liquid state happens to have. Okay. Oh, well, let me say this first. Uh, when you talk about a solid or liquid, and these are significantly different than gases, right? Because they're sort of stuck together. Why is that? See if this makes sense. A solid and a liquid, the particles are stuck together because the attractive forces between the particles are greater than the kinetic energy of the particles themselves. So if the attractive forces between the particles are really, really strong and they're greater than the energy of the molecules or particles themselves, 
the particles have to be stuck together and they'll form a solid. That would be like if I had a cat and I wanted to hold the cat next to me, that'd be like we're a solid, we're stuck together. The cat has some energy and the cat doesn't wanna be with me. So the cat's gonna struggle and struggle to get away. But if my attractive force to the cat is greater than the cat's kinetic energy, we're stuck together. That's a solid or liquid. Does that make sense? But what if the cat had more energy than my attractive force? The cat would escape from me and we would be independent now. That's what's happening in a gas. So if the attractive forces between the particles are less than the attractive, than the kinetic energy of the particles themselves, the kinetic energy wins, the particles break apart, and then you would have a picture like the third picture up here on the slide, the substance would now be a gas, okay? That's gonna be important in determining why things are solids, liquids, and gases, understanding that solids and liquids must have greater inner particle attractive forces than their individual particles kinetic energy. But a gas has much weaker attractive forces than the individual particles kinetic energy. That's why the particles can separate from each other and exist independently, okay? So with that in mind, let's move on to now properties of liquids and solids. And we wanna talk about liquids first. I'm gonna give you three properties that anything in the liquid state has. First, liquids always possess a property called surface tension. It's the resistance of a liquid to an increase in its surface area. It's a fancy way of saying, if I can personify for a minute, liquid molecules wanna be in the middle of the liquid they don't wanna be on the surface of the liquid. It's essentially because the surface molecules or surface particles are less stable. Why would that be? Look at a glass of water. Look at any one of the molecules on the surface. It's attracted by all the other molecules around it. So if I pick this particular molecule here, the middle water molecule on the surface is attracted by count them, one, two, three, four, five other molecules. So the more attraction, the more stable it is. So it has five attractions. But pick a molecule in the middle. How many attractions does this one have? Count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, that's more. So when you're in the middle of the liquid, you're attracted by molecules all around you, which means you're undergoing more attraction, which means you're more stable. So the molecules are always gonna arrange themselves so the majority of them can be in the interior and the least number of them can be on the surface. So that's what the definition of surface tension is. It's the resistance to a liquid to increase its surface areas, okay? So this phenomenon results in liquids minimizing their surface area. They'll always take out the least amount of surface area so the least number of molecules have to be in these unstable positions. I'll give you another kind of weird example of that. If you ever go to Alaska, up in the top of Alaska is called the North Slope and this huge area, it's like the size, at least the size of, I don't know what, is that size of Montana and Nebraska and North Dakota altogether, really big. But there's big herds of caribou up there and the caribou migrate through the Northern slopes of Alaska and eating whatever they can eat. And as they migrate around, they always clump in herds. And when they, and the reason they clump in herds is there's another animal that lives in Alaska. Sometimes it's called the state bird. It's called the mosquito. And the mosquito and then other biting insects as well as the mosquito attack caribou. And they give them stings and they bite them and they gnaw their fur and go into their ears and nose. And it's really kind of disgusting. If you ever look at like a caribou, they always have all these pit marks all over them. It's all these insect attacks. So if you're a caribou, where do you think you're more likely to get attacked by a, a, a biting insect? Here on the surface or here in the interior? Ooh, this is the bad spot here. All the insects are gonna come up and get you. So the caribou try to get into the interior because that's a more safe place to be. So caribou are a lot like liquids. They try to maximize the number of caribou in the interior and minimize the number of caribou on the outside because that's a less favorable spot, okay? So liquids do the same thing. Okay, and it turns out for liquids, the stronger their attractive forces, the stronger their surface tension is gonna be. So the more likely they are to try to not increase their surface area. Water has pretty strong uh, attractive forces between the molecules. They have things called hydrogen bonds that we're gonna learn in a couple of days. So because they're so strong, you don't wanna actually leave from the middle of the water and have to go onto the surface. So you don't wanna increase the surface area. So that's why if you take like a, 
a steel sewing pin and you lay it down onto a, 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 a container of water, the sewing pin, even though it's way more dense than water, will not sink. It'll stay on the top because the water molecules would have to bend and allow more molecules on the surface to let the, the uh, pin pass through. So they don't do that. They hold down below with their strong attractive forces and they can actually support the weight of that pin by that surface tension. That's why a mosquito can sit on water. A mosquito is more dense than water. It should sink just like you would sink, right? But because of the surface tension, the surface tension pre prevents the, uh, the mosquito from going in. If we wind up having the Olympics this year, and if not this year, next year, you should watch the diving, especially the 10 meter diving. When they're doing the diving, when you're watching them, if you look down at the very bottom of the pool in the corner, you're gonna see a little like hole in the side of the pool with a hose and water coming out and shooting into the pool during the diving. Why is that? Because if you dive from 10 meters up and hit the surface of the water, it's gonna be just like what happens to the mosquito. The water's not gonna to wanna to move out of the way to let you break in there. So the surface tension will cause bam, a hard hit on your head and you're gonna feel it trying to break the water's surface tension. So on the side of the pool, they have water shooting in, churning up the water on the top, breaking the surface tension. So when the divers go in, it doesn't hurt as much when they hit the water. They don't have to overcome the surface tension. It's already been overcome by that little hosey water that's splashing in on the side, kind of weird. If you go into the International Space Station and you release a little bit of water into the space station where there's zero gravity, the water will take this shape. Why does it take this shape? Because mm. gravity would make things be flat because of like it would splatter on the ground versus anti-gravity, it would be spherical. Maybe, maybe true statement, but the water molecules don't care about gravity. Why are the mo water molecules taking this shape? Somebody's phoning in an answer, let's see. Because a sphere has the least amount of surface area, so the least number of water molecules have to be in these unstable positions. Ms. Eckes is exactly right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Same thing would happen if you put a liquid into a graduated cylinder the very top of the graduated cylinder, the water or the liquid level should be a curve like this because you know what that is? That's the fraction of a sphere. So this is actually the most efficient way for liquids in glass tubes to behave to minimize their surface area. Is that what the water looked like when you were reading water in graduated cylinders in experiment two? No, it didn't look like that. That's kind of weird. That's because something else is happening to the water that overcomes the surface tension. That's an, another property of a liquid. It's called capillary action. Capillary action is a phenomenon that results in the rising of liquid in a narrow tube. If you watch the video on the paper chromatography lab, uh, you notice that they transferred liquids onto the chromatogram by putting a capillary tube into a liquid and then the liquid sucked up into the capillary tube and then you went over to the paper and you touched it to the paper and it blooped out. So when you put narrow tubes in contact with a liquid, the liquid's gonna be drawn up into that capillary tube. Why is that happening? That's happening when there are strong attract forces between the liquid particles and the container. Capillary tube, and a graduated cylinder are made of the same thing. And you know what they're made of? What's a, what's a graduated cylinder made of? Think back to last week. What did they look like when you were holding them and touching them? Glass. They're made of glass. Glass is a polar substance. It has positive and negative ends to it. What do you know about water? It's polar. It has positive and negative ends. So the positive end of the water molecules can attract to the negative end of the glass and the water molecules will stick to the glass. And the next one will jump on top of that one and stick to the glass above it. And then it'll jump on top of that and stick to the glass above it. So the water will stick to glass because it has a really strong attraction. And so when you put water into a graduated cylinder, even though the best shape would be a meniscus like I showed you before, the water molecules are attracting to the glass on the left and attracting to the glass on the right, and that curls up the meniscus in the opposite direction 
see, this is actually a wrong meniscus, right? The, but this is what we think is the natural meniscus. This only happens because of capillary action, okay? Third property of liquids is a property known as viscosity. It's something you can actually measure. It's the measure of a liquid's resistance to flow. Some liquids don't flow very quickly. We would say they're very viscous. Do you know what might be true about the individual molecules in the liquid? If a liquid is really, really viscous, why, why might this liquid, this molasses here, be really viscous, but water flows really quickly? What's the difference between them, do you think? Molasses is nonpolar. So what would nonpolar do? Would that mean the molecules would attract more or attract less? Um, attract less. If they attract less, I would argue they would flow faster then. Oh. See you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't know whether it's polar or not, but if the molasses is sticking together and not flowing very well, it must mean that it has really strong attractive forces because it's preventing it from moving. So the stronger the attractive forces between the liquid particles, the more viscous the liquid will be. What is, an, what is it that's in molasses, do you think? that might be causing strong attractions and preventing it from flowing? What's a major component of molasses? Sugar. Sugar. And sugar molecules are very polar and they attract really strongly to water molecules. So the attraction between the sugar and the water in the molasses is so strong that it doesn't flow as easily. And that's why molasses is very viscous. Exactly correct, okay? So those are some lovely properties of liquids that I would like you to know. We're gonna spend most of the rest of this particular chapter, chapter 10, talking about substances in a solid state. And when you have something existing as a solid, there's actually two generic types of solids. There are solids that are called crystalline solids. And that's when on the microscopic level, each of the individual particles, the ions, the atoms, or the molecules have a regular repeating pattern to them. But there actually are some solids where the making up the substance have a random particle arrangement. Those are called amorphous solids, okay? Anytime big old crystal somewhere, like you go to a museum and go, wow, look at that really cool crystal. Well, that's a crystalline solid. The particles making up that material have a regular repeating pattern, okay? Uh, silicon and oxygen can form a regular repeating pattern, and that's what I have in my picture on the left. That's a crystal but silicon and oxygen can also form another arrangement that I have on the right, which is not a regular pattern. That looks more random. That's amorphous. Now, these are actually called sand and glass. So sand is the result of silicon and oxygen bonding in a regular repeating pattern. If you melt the sand and you destroy this regular repeating pattern, then freeze it quickly, you're gonna get it to form a solid like on the right side where the pattern is amorphous, it's more random, and that's how you get glass. So sand is an example of a crystalline solid. Glass is an example of an amorphous solid. This is an example of sugar, two different forms of sugar, one in the crystalline form and then one in the uh, amorphous form. This is called rock candy. This is called cotton candy. And rock candy is sugar molecules arranged in a regular repeating pattern. But cotton candy is sugar molecules that have been turned into a solid, but they have a random particle arrangement. So that's an example of amorphous. So you've come into contact with uh, solids that are both amorphous and crystalline. And so just so you know, there's actually two different forms of those. Now, when matter exists in the solid form, that means it's a, a bunch of particles, either regular arrangement or random arrangement. And these particles can either be atoms, ions, or molecules. And so we're gonna talk about the structure of solid matter, and we're gonna classify it based upon whether the individual particles making up the, the solid, and we're gonna call these the lattice points, the individual particles making up the lattice points are either ions, atoms, or molecules. So matter is classified by the particles that make up the lattice points when it exists as a crystalline solid. And so to try to study solids, we're going to take all solid matter and we're going to divide it into three categories based upon what the lattice point particles are. And the lattice point particles can either be ions or atoms or molecules. 
Now, if the lattice point particles are ions, can you think of an example of any solid that's made up of ions? Sodium chloride. Perfect. These are going to be things that are ionic, metals with nonmetals. Exactly right. So we'll talk about properties of ionic matter, things that are made up of metals and nonmetals that we know bond ionically that are created of ions. Perfect. Exactly correct. Now, if things are made of atoms, it actually turns out that the atoms that make up the material can either be bonded or not bonded. Now, what do I mean by that? We talked about metals early at the beginning of the test two material where metals are millions of millions of atoms that are bonded by metallic bonds. So you can have bonded atoms that are metals. That's called metallic. There's another classification we'll identify today. You've probably never heard of it before, but it's called macromolecular. We'll explain what that is in a little bit. But these are two types of matter in which the crystal lattice particles are atoms and they're all bonded together with some type of chemical bonds. Metallic matter is bonded together with metallic bonds. Turns out macromolecular matter is bonded together with covalent bonds. There are some things that can exist as atoms, but they're not bonded together. Can you think about what I'm talking about here? It's one specific type of thing. What could that be? What kind of substance can you think of that's made up of atoms, but the atoms don't bond to each other? Got you baffled on that one. That would be noble gases. Remember, they already have complete outer shells. They don't bond. So if you have a noble gas, let's say argon, you can cool it down till it becomes a solid. And that solid would be millions and millions of noble gas atoms, but they don't bond to each other. There's no covalent bonds, no metallic bonds, no ionic bonds, okay? The last type of matter is gonna be matter composed of molecules. And the molecules, we're gonna break down into whether the molecules are polar or nonpolar because that actually causes them to have distinctly different properties. So if you look at the very bottom here, all solid matter can be broken up into seven classifications. Ions that are make up of ionic matter, atoms that make up metallic matter, atoms that make up macromolecular matter, or atoms that make up noble gas. And then finally, molecules that are either polar or nonpolar, okay? The ion, ionic matter, as Mr. Filippo already said, is always a metal-nonmetal combination. We'll talk about those first. Metallic matter is always just made of metal atoms. That's fairly obvious. All the other categories are gonna be combinations of nonmetals. So nonmetals do a wide variety of things. And today we're gonna to talk about the properties of ionic matter, metallic matter, and then we're gonna introduce this new thing called macromolecular matter. And I'm gonna do these three because these happen to be the three types of matter that when they're solids, they have really, really high melting points. So they have really strong attractions in the crystals. It's hard to melt them. And then the last categories uh, we'll talk, actually I said seven before, there's actually six categories. The last three we'll talk about then uh, tomorrow, okay? So here we go, ionic matter, what is this? It's matter composed of ions. What's holding those ions together is gonna be a big question, okay? So this is matter composed of positive and negative ions. Mr. Filippo has already given us one example, the first one I've listed here, sodium chloride but it could be any compound that's made up of a metal ion and a non-metal ion. So sodium chloride, barium fluoride, cesium sulfide, or it could have things with polyatomic ions in them too. Those are ions. So like magnesium nitrate would be an example of an ionic type of matter. So these are all considered metal, non-metal ion combinations, all right? So that means on the periodic table, the compound is always gonna be uh, something from the metal side and then something from the non-metal side, okay? And then when you form a crystal of sodium chloride or magnesium nitrate, the lattice points will be the positive and negative ions. A crystal of salt looks like this, a green chloride ion, a yellow sodium ion, a green chloride ion, a yellow sodium ion, repeating in this repeating uh, pattern over and over and over again until the crystal gets really, really big. So the particles that are at each of these little points in the crystal, which are called the lattice points, are positive metal ions and negative non-metal ions. So for an ionic crystal, any ionic matter, the lattice points making up the crystal are positive ions and negative ions. Now, 
why does this crystal stick together? Why do the sodium ions and the chloride ions stick to each other? Because they're oppositely charged and opposite charges attract. And we have a name for that. The name for the attraction of a positive ion to a negative ion is called an ionic bond. So ionic crystals are bonded together with ionic bonds. That's just the attraction between the positive and negative ions themselves. And it turns out that's actually really strong in terms of uh, uh, microscopic attractions. And if you have a, a solid where the particles are stuck together really, really strong, if you wanna melt that, if you wanna break those apart from each other, you have to raise it to a really, really high temperature. So therefore, all ionic substances have melting points and boiling points that are really high. Because to melt them, that means you have to pull the ions apart from each other. And because they're attracted so strongly, it would take a lot of energy to do that. Salt, <clears throat> you have to heat it up to 803 degrees before it actually melts. So these ionic substances have high melting points due to the strengths of their ionic bonds. And this number won't mean anything to you, but I just want to use it as a reference. Uh, ionic bonds have a strength of about 400 kilojoules per mole. So whatever that means, you have no idea. But when we compare it to other attractive forces, <clears throat> you can at least see whether the other attractive forces are stronger or weaker than the ionic bonds by comparing the numbers. Okay. Now, <clears throat> do ionic types of matter dissolve in water? Mr. Filippo says, yes, he has been to the beach once or twice and accidentally swallowed a little bit of ocean water and goes, oh my gosh, it tastes like salt because salt dissolves in water, okay? So we would say ionic substances have high water solubility. Here's why. Because ionic compounds are made of positive and negative ions and water molecules are polar, they have positive and negative ends to them. So the pole positive ends of the water molecules can attract negative ions and the negative ends of water molecules can attract positive ions. So the water molecules can pull the positive and negative ions into the water and therefore dissolve them. Okay, that's why the solubility is high. One other property of ionic matter I'd like you to be familiar with, and this may not make sense yet, but we'll try to explain it because you may not know the whole story behind electrical conductivity. But if you take a big old salt crystal and you stick two electrodes on it, and you try to see if a salt crystal will conduct electricity, it does not. But if you dissolve salt in water and you test the conductivity of that solution, it does conduct. So ionic matter does not conduct in the solid state, but it does conduct if you melt it into a liquid at a high temperature or just dissolve it in the water at regular old room temperature. These two conditions, you can actually make it a conductive material. Now, why, electrical. Say it again. Uh, why is that? That as a solid, it doesn't uh, conduct electricity. Fine question. We will answer that question on the next page. First, we need to understand what electrical conductivity means. It means electricity can flow through the material. So a solid crystal of salt, there's no electricity that can flow through it. But dissolved in water, electricity can flow through it. What is electricity? Electricity is charged particles moving in one direction. If your computer is plugged in right now to the outlet in your room, then there are charged particles moving from the wall to your computer in one direction and then going back out. So whenever charged particles move in one direction, that's called electricity. Do you have an idea what the charged particles are that are moving from the wall through your computer and back to cause electrical conduction? You know what those charged particles are? Electrons. So in the wiring of your laptop and your house and stuff, electrons are the mobile charge particles. But do you see it says electrons in this definition? No, it doesn't have to be electrons. It could be any charged particle, okay? So electrical conductivity is just the ability of a material to have charged particles move through it in one direction. And they can be any type of charged particle. They can be an electron, or it can be a positive ion, or it can be a negative ion. All right, so now let's go to Mr. Gomez's question. How come a solid chunk of salt cannot conduct electricity? A solid chunk of salt is, contains positive and negative ions. Mr. Gomez, it has positive and negative charged particles, but think about the picture of the solid from the beginning of the lecture. They're stuck in the crystal lattice. They can't move from their spot. So it does have charged particles, but they can't move. So therefore it does not conduct electricity. 
Mr. Gomez, do you want to give me a reason for why if we dissolve salt in water, that will now conduct electricity? Uh, because it's solution and the charged ions can move. Yes, yes, yes. So when you melt it or dissolve it, the individual ions break out of the crystal and they float around in the water. And if you put some big old charge in the water, you can make all the negative ions go to the positive charge and you can make all the positive ions go to the negative charge. So the charged ions now are free to move. And if they can move throughout the solution, that is electricity, okay? It doesn't say electrons on there, does it? So when you dissolve a salt in water, electrons aren't moving through a solution. All there is in a solution is water molecules and then sodium ions and chloride ions. So what are the charged particles? The sodium ions and chloride ions, those are the ones that move to allow conduction to go when you dissolve the ionic compound in water, okay? <clears throat> One final property about ionic crystals, if you were to go like to the Natural History Museum up at uh, Los Angeles at USC and see these really beautiful crystals they have, and if you came up with a beautiful crystal with a hammer and hit it, you would shatter it. Oh, that would be horrible. You'd how long it takes to build these big crystals and then you crush it. So they're repulsive, they're brittle, or the ionic crystals are brittle due to repulsions that exist between the ions when you hammer them. If you take a salt crystal and you take a hammer, and you hit it, watch what happens to the ions when I hit it. Bonk! They get smashed over. What do you see is happening right here? Here, 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 here. What's happening? Repulsion. Like charges, they repel. So the whole thing will shatter and it'll break across a big old face. Have you ever seen people like tap crystals and they break into like two like perfectly even faces like that or halves? That's because when the ions shift, they all shift over and you break it into a, a face like that. But nonetheless, this causes them to break apart when they're hammered, and so therefore they're considered to be brittle, okay? Those are the properties for ionic matter I would like you to know. <clears throat> Let's move on to metallic matter. This would be any matter that's only composed of billions and billions of metal atoms. So this would be like the aluminum in an aluminum can or the silver in some silver earrings. Uh, so, or other examples would be iron would be metallic, gold would be metallic. You can mix metals together, as long as they're only metals, copper and tin would make bronze. That would be an example of a metallic substance. And so therefore, whenever you look for something in this particular category, you're only picking, picking things from the red part of the periodic table. This is where all the metals are. So if you have atoms of these red elements, you have a metallic substance. And when you look at a crystal, let's say iron, all it is is millions and millions of iron atoms. When I say atom, what's the difference between atom and iron? One's a charged particle, one's a not. When I say ions, they're charged. When I use the word atom, I mean they're not charged. This isn't an Fe2 plus ion. This is million of Fe0 atoms, millions and millions of them like this, okay? So the lattice points are metal atoms as opposed to metal ions, okay? <clears throat> now, what holds metal atoms together? What's the attractive force between the atoms called, do you know? Uh, that's unfortunate. That could be the first question on your test on Monday. Attractive force. Oh, someone's coming through with an answer. Let's see. Henry D. Filippo says intermolecular forces. So I tell you what, intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. Okay. Lattice points are atoms. So I wouldn't use the term intermolecular force because there actually are no molecules in this. Okay. Mr. D. Filippo agrees with me now. Okay. So let's see, if you have a bunch of metal atoms, how do they bond together? What's that called? There's a name for that. Uh, it's called, um, uh, oh yeah, that really tricky name, metallic bonds, right? Do we remember that? I think I'll ask you on the test on Monday, how do metals bond, how do non-metals bond, how do metals and non-metals bond? You should know that. I stuck delocalized in front of that. You like that? We just learned that word yesterday. Delocalized means the electrons are spread out over many atoms. That's what metallic bonds are, right? Remember, the metal atoms lose their valence electrons, they migrate around all the metal atoms and they attract all the nuclei and that's called a metallic bond. So it's the attraction between these valence bonding electrons that are migrating around the metal and then all the metal nuclei. 
Okay, metallic bonding. Metallic bonds are pretty strong. So if they're strong and you want to melt a metal, you've got to use a lot of energy to do that. So that means the melting points and boiling points of metals are going to be high. That's why metals are solids at room temperature. If you want to melt iron, you have to heat it up to 1500 degrees. And this is why, because the metallic bonds are so strong that it's hard to break apart those metal atoms from each other. So metallic bonds have high melting points and boiling points due to the strength of the metallic bonds, which are on the average about, oh, 400 kilojoules per mole, which is the same number we had for the ionic bonds. So therefore you can assume ionic and metallic bonds are about equal in strength. Now they're not 100% that way. There are some ionic bonds that are stronger and some ionic bonds that are weaker. And there are some metallic bonds that are stronger and some metallic bonds that are weaker. But on the average, about 400 kilojoules per mole. So you cannot necessarily tell if ionically bonded compounds have higher melting points than metallically bonded compounds. I just want you to know they're both gonna be high. Do uh, metals dissolve in water? Some of you come to class this afternoon, if you park your car at three o'clock and it starts to rain on it, when you come back, is your car gonna be dissolved away? No, it doesn't dissolve in the water. Don't miss that on test three. That would be a really embarrassing one. That's because atoms are neutral. They don't get attracted to positive and negative ions. So it's not gonna dissolve. So at least your car will be safe if it rains today. Do metals conduct electricity? Yes, and you know why? Because there's charged particles can move. And those charged particles are the bonding electrons, those valence electrons that are shed, that migrate throughout the entire piece of metal. And as long as those get moved in one direction, then you will have conductivity. So notice how metals conduct distinctly differently than dissolved ionic compounds. Metals conduct because they have mobile electrons, but ionic compounds conduct when they're dissolved because their positive and negative ions are able to move, okay? Now, if you bring your car to campus today at uh, three o'clock and I come out to meet you and I have my hammer with you and I hammer the door of your car, is it gonna shatter? Is it brittle? Will it break into a million pieces? What will happen to your door? It'll make a dent, right? Yeah, metals are not brittle. Metals are malleable. You can change their shape and they're ductile. You can make them into wire because if you shift the metal crystal with a hammer, it doesn't cause the repulsive forces you saw in our example that we had before for ionic matter because there aren't any ions in a metal. There's just millions of, in this case, blue metal atoms and the little white dots are the valence electrons. And those valence electrons are moving around, attracting all the nuclei. So if I come up to your car and I'm gonna pretend to check your temperature, but really I'm gonna try to bash your door in and I hit the hammer onto your door and some of the door moves over like that. Well, the valence electrons just move with it and they still hold all these together. It's just now in a distorted or different shape. So you get a dent. So metals, because they don't have positive negative rep uh, repulsions when you hit them, turn out to not be brittle, so they're malleable or ductile instead. Okay? Lovely. Final type of category I want to talk about is something new called macromolecular matter. Okay? And as we pointed out before, macromolecular matter is actually composed of non-metal atoms only. So the three high melting point types of solids, ionic, metallic, and macromolecular, ionic matter is made up of metals and nonmetals. Metallic matter is made up of metals. Macromolecular matter is composed of nonmetals and specifically nonmetal atoms from groups 13 and 14 on the periodic table. These are the only non-metals that actually form these macromolecular substances that have really high melting points and boiling points. And there's maybe, I don't know, four common examples of macromolecular substances. And I would think I would just like you to know what they are, okay? They are elemental boron, elemental carbon in the allotrope of diamond, elemental silicon, and then a material called silica, which is essentially what sand is or quartz. These are macromolecular substances. You might recognize they have high melting points. Diamonds have high melting points. Sand has a high melting point, okay? Now, 
Where are they on the periodic table? Where they're non-metals, where are the non-metals on the periodic table? They're over here, but I only said the non-metals from groups 13 and 14, that would be these, boron, carbon, and silicon. These atoms are actually made to make multiple bonds, and then those atoms are able to bond to others and bond to others and bond to others. So they create something different than all the other non-metals. All the other non-metals, when they covalently bond, they form little units called molecules, okay? These actually don't. They can form one continuous material in which all the atoms are covalently bonded together. So that's a little bit different in terms of structure. So boron's located right here. Carbon or diamond is here. Silicon is here. And then you can get silicon bonding with oxygen to make a macromolecular substance too. Those of you that were in lab on Monday and they were coming today, there's actually one other example of a macromolecular substance. You actually had it in lab. It was the black solid, silicon carbide. Look at that. It's made of these two. That's a macromolecular substance, okay? So if you look at an example of this macromolecular substance, it's going to be millions and millions of non-metal atoms, and they're all going to be covalently bonded together. Okay, So the lattice points in the crystal are non-metal atoms, but millions and millions and millions of them, and they're all covalently bonded together. And that's the significant difference between what these non-metals do and what all the other non-metals do. The other non-metals like sulfur makes S8 molecules. A crystal is millions and millions of S8 molecules. How does one molecule bond to another molecule? I don't know. We'll have to talk about that tomorrow. It must be some weak kind of attractive force. In a glass of water, how does one water molecule bond to another? I don't know. There must be some kind of weak attractive force. But in diamond or sand, one carbon atom is bonded to four others, and those are bonded to four others, and those are bonded to four others, and those are bonded to four others, and they continue to bond all the way from the middle carbon atom in the diamond to the very outside carbon atom. So this giant crystal of diamond is actually one big molecule. You ever thought you'd never see a molecule in your life because it's too small? Well, you have. If you've ever seen a diamond or a grain of sand, those are essentially one, well, look at this, giant molecule. That's why these are called macromolecular. Each crystal is essentially one molecule because the whole thing is covalently bonded together. So the attractive forces between all the atoms in a macromolecular substance are these covalent bonds. And I'll be more specific here because now we know this term. I'll say localized covalent bond. That just means the electrons are stuck in the region of space between the pair of atoms that are bonding. So you have covalent bonding holding these nonmetal atoms together, and it essentially makes the crystal one giant molecule. So these covalent bonds are, this is just the definition of covalent bonding from our test two material, the attraction between bonding electrons and the nonmetal nuclei. Now, diamond and sand have really high melting points. That means the attractive forces in diamond and sand must be really strong. That means covalent bonds must be really strong, and that's a true statement. So the melting points of macromolecular substances are high due to the strengths of their covalent bonds, which are, oh, look at that, about 400 kilojoules per mole. So every one of the types of bonding we've talked about today, metallic bonding, ionic bonding, and uh, covalent bond, are about the same strength kilojoules per mole, okay? And that's high enough to make them high melting point solids. Does diamond dissolve in water? No. Can dissolve in water? No, it wouldn't have a place called Laguna Beach. There wouldn't be a beach if the sand dissolved in water, right? That wouldn't make sense. You don't want to miss that one on the test. So no, uh, there's no solubility between these things and water because these are made up of atoms that are neutral and the neutral atoms do not attract to the positive and negative ends of water molecules. So low solubility. This will be an important consideration in the lab this week when you're trying to separate silicon carbide from other materials. Silicon carbide is a macromolecular substance. It doesn't dissolve in water. So if it doesn't dissolve, but the other substances do, that gives us a way to separate it from the other two components. And finally, in terms of electrical conductivity, it turns out diamonds do not conduct electricity and sand does not conduct electricity. There's no ions in it to move. It does have electrons, but where are the electrons? 
They're in localized covalent bonds. They're stuck in the regions of space between the nuclei, so they are not free to move. They're not in delocalized molecular orbitals. So we would say no, because there's no charged particles that are able to move, no mobile charged particles.